I'm going to run through some research topics. I'm just the one presenting it. There's a whole team of us who have done work in this area and it's really becoming the focus of a lot of the research we're doing um, in the Department of Resource Management and Geography at, at Melbourne Uni and also uh, in particular at, at Burnley. So, um, and I'm, I'm an ecologist. I've spent a fair bit of time out in the west looking at native grasslands, a lot of which are no longer here. Um, but I'm particularly now moving uh, into uh, looking at green infrastructure. And so we've got a number of issues with our urban environment, as, as Greg and, and, and Rod have so, you know, spoken about well today in terms of high energy use, we've got health impacts, we've got poor air quality in, in, in particular areas, uh, we've got flooding, water quality issues. And, you know, we think about these are problems for Melbourne, but we're actually pretty well off compared to a lot of other cities uh, around the world. And so we're thinking that um, urban green infrastructure can be um, a pretty good way of, of in, uh, mitigating some of these problems. And by that, we're, we're talking about a whole range of things. So it ranges from the natural vegetation, um, the designed urban large spaces, uh, through to quite small scale things such as vegetable gardens and, and individual street trees. So it works at multiple scales across multiple jurisdictions, both public and private, uh, natural and designed. Um, and so the, the thing that we're interested in is uh, really about how vegetation can provide ecosystem services. And so we've already heard a lot about the benefits that this, this green infrastructure can provide, but why aren't we doing this? Why, why don't we recognise the, the, the carbon sequestration benefits, the, the jobs benefits, the tourism benefits? Um, there's individual bits of work out there, but when the decisions get made, it's not necessarily all collated <coughs> together. So what we're interested in doing is, is overcoming those barriers um, to uh, basically coming up with uh, an ecopolis, which is, uh, this is a front cover of New Scientist from a few years ago, but recognising that cities are actually quite an important thing. The world is becoming increasingly urbanised. The projections are huge in terms of how urbanisation is going to impact uh, the world and cities are, can actually be a good thing. You know, we get a whole lot of economies of scale in terms of water distribution, uh, energy uh, distribution, uh, and also there's, there's other things. Public health outcomes are better in urban areas. Uh, education of women leads to fertility drops, etc. So um, there's a whole lot of benefits that come with urban areas, but there are issues as well. And so how do we get green infrastructure into them? Um, and so there's sort of technical barriers, um, new technology, an example, adapting uh, existing technologies from overseas to local conditions, economic barriers and social barriers. So I'm going to run through a, a few case studies today, but a lot of the problem um, we feel is for some things a lack of scientific, da scientific data applicable to Australia. So there's been work done overseas, but how can we apply it here? How do we have to tweak it? Or people will say, well, we haven't proven it in our environment. How does it work here? Um, and as a consequence, relying on overseas experience of technology can be pr problematic because our climate is different. We have different plants. We have different uh, seasons uh, with different extremes to how things may have worked in the Northern Hemisphere. And because of this, people start to perceive a risk. You know, well, can I do that? Can I put a green roof on? Can I use water in a different way? Uh, and this can increase cost, particularly if you're doing it the first time. And so there's often a need for someone who's prepared to take that risk, whether it's a local government or a government department, to say, look, this can be done. And, um, and so we believe that um, we need basic research to objectively evaluate the performance of these green infrastructure solutions, the cost of them, their social acceptability. It's great if they work, but unless people that, um, will, will accept it, it's going to be a problem. You'll be able to roll that out. And the, the environmental benefits, and are they, do they work in Australia as other parts of the world, or are they greater? And using demonstration projects um, that have a funded research component may be a really good way of doing this. So sort of adaptive management of your project, understanding what's happening, and feeding back into research outcomes, and research feeding back into policy, leading back to informed policy decisions. So I'm going to talk briefly about three sort of projects we're doing at Burnley, some green roof work that I've been involved with, um, some urban tree stuff that Steve Liversley's been working on, and, and some smart garden watering that Jeff Canal and, um, and Nigel Stork and others have, have basically building on a lot of work that's been done at, at Burnley over time. 
Um, so in terms of green roofs, these are a new technology for Australia, but very common um, in, in parts of Europe and, and increasingly so in North America. Basically, it's a roof that uses plants to improve its performance, its appearance, or both. Uh, and most contain, you know, plants on the top, uh, some sort of specially designed substrate, a drainage layer to get the water off uh, quickly, and a, a protection layers for the roof itself. Uh, and that's what it sort of looks like in, in profile. Um, there's two types, intensive green roofs with a deeper organic growing media. Uh, heavy, uh, these tend to be heavy and need structural support. And there's so examples of this around uh, Melbourne and Australia. We, we do these ones, we know how to do these sort of green roofs. But we're particularly interested in the extensive green roofs. So these are shallower mineral based systems um, which are usually planted with tough um, low growing plants. And the important thing about this is they can be retrofitted to existing building stock. And most of our building stock's going to be around in the future. We're not recreating our cities entirely. So how do we retrofit uh, these sort of systems um, as a climate change adaptation measure? Um, so we're, we're doing a number of trials around green roofs. We're lucky enough to get an Australian uh, Research Council grant with DSE and Melbourne Water as partners, the City of Melbourne as well. Um, and looking at um, trials that plants will survive and look good under Australian conditions, so looking at survival, looking at droughting them, how long will they live without water, um, developing lightweight local substrates so they don't have to import them from, from overseas and very interested in recycled materials there and uh, effects of green roofs on building energy budgets, on urban hydrology and also the social research to understand whether people accept this as a new, new form of doing things. So we established a small green roof at Burnley in 2008 and did uh, some plantings. Uh, we were trialling different types of plant species and we basically only used irrigation to establish it. Uh, we tried a range of different uh, native uh, forbs, uh, native grasses and grass-like plants and also um, some succulents, native succulents and exotic succulents. And, um, and that's sort of some idea of the changes. So we planted in August, August 2008. It looked fantastic in October. Uh, and by January it was starting to look a bit sick and by March everything was dead, pretty much. <laughs> Not quite everything though. And so all individuals of 28 species were, were dead. So a lot of those native grasses and herbs died, but it, you know, this summer, it's the heat waves we're talking about, there was basically no rain from November through to the end of February. Um, <coughs> but three species survived and did well. So these plants are basically indestructible, and if we're looking at our climate, these things would be a good thing to have in green roofs, and then we can start supplementing them with, with uh, other, other plants to create interest. If, if you have no irrigation, if you have irrigation from tank water, or uh, recycled water, you can start to do more things. So we're starting with a scorched earth policy to start with. And we're trialling more species. We've got people looking at uh, natural granite outcrops, and so uh, very similar to a roof, it's a an habitat analogue. So we're trialling species from Terek Terek National Park. There are outcrops out there and other things. We've also developed three substrates, uh, a locally based one on scoria, uh, one from uh, bottom ash from power stations, which is very light, so it's very good for retrofitting and also uh, one on crushed roof tiles as well, so trying to find a use for a waste product. As well as developing the technology, we're trying to um, understand the benefits. And so green roofs are a water sensitive urban design measure that don't need additional space. There's not that many places in the urban environment where we can start to put large wetlands to mitigate that stormwater flow. And so um, this is a graph from, from a colleague in, in Belgium, but basically shows that um, green roofs can substantially decrease the quantity uh, of stormwater and so as the peak flows are reduced and it's released over time. A lot of that water is absorbed into the substrate um, and that does depend on the depth of substrate and the composition of that substrate, what it's made of. Certain materials will absorb more water which can then be evaporated off and cool the urban landscape. And this is work that Tim Fletcher at, at Monash has, has done. Um, we're collaborating on a number of things. Um, so th this graph, basically, um, uh, if the, the green roof absorbs five millimetres of every rainfall event, or 7.5 millimetres every rainfall event in, that occurs, the mean annual flow is, is um, reduced uh, by 50% if it's a five millimetre loss. So the amount of water coming off a green roof is halved 
for, for, for if it, each if that green roof absorbs five millimetres. And so if, you, if it absorbs 12 metres, millimetres of rainfall, you know, 80% reduction in stormwater flow off roofs. That water is kept on the roof for evapotranspiration for cooling the urban landscape. Um, uh, green roofs will also work really well uh, to um, insulate buildings. So the actual substrate provides a big insulating uh, factor and, the, and the, the plants provide shade and evaporative cooling as well. And so if you have large areas of green roofs, particularly in, in areas like um, activity centres or the large big box type developments, large warehouses, large factories where there's lots of roof space, a lot of hard impervious surfaces, you can start to reduce the temperature in those areas and provide insulative benefits for those buildings themselves. So we've done some work at Burnley, our little tiny green roof, we fitted it with thermocouples to measure the temperature on the, on the, uh, the green roof here and we've got an identical room on the other side which we measured the temperature as well. And so we measured the temperature and the data concurs with CSIRO building models so we know that it, it works and um, the test room is on, underneath the green roof is on average one degree cooler than the control room um, over the summer period. And this building at Burnley is a 1940s big brick concrete building so in a more modern building the benefits are going to be greater. So um, this is modelling done by, by CSIRO but assuming an air conditioned office to 20 <coughs> degrees for heating and cooling and occupied between 8 and 6 p.m. the modelling that CSIRO have done using our data suggests that the summer energy used, used to cool that room would be reduced by 34 percent. So reducing air conditioning energy used by 34 percent and winter heating used by 13 percent. Start multiplying that over large urban areas, you're talking massive savings in the amount of energy used, the amount of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere from power stations. Okay, moving on to um, the next sort of work. This is work that Steve, uh, Steve Livers and Tom Fairman have done. Sheridan's actually talking about eye trees at the moment in the other room. Um, it's an American um, uh, system um, for modelling the benefits of, of uh, street trees on trees in the urban climate and the other environmental benefits and um, basically uh, run th systems through it uh, uh, and you can model the urban forest in terms of the amount of benefits it's providing. And so Tom looked at uh, the city of Hume and the city of Melbourne, did some sampling in those black areas on those, those streets and um, the important thing to take a note here is that Hume has pr predominantly a, a native canopy whereas the city of Melbourne has an exotic canopy and then started to look at the, the benefits uh, provided by that urban forest. And this is really an evaluation for eye trees for the uh, Australian uh, environment. And coming out of that is, is a project that Sharon is talking about at the moment in terms of modifying it to work under our conditions that the city of Melbourne, Moonee Valley and, and uh, Port Phillip are, are working on. And so these are, these are results for carbon dioxide in terms of sequestration. So because Hume has a younger, younger, um, more trees that are younger, growing more actively, um, it's more, uh, more sequestration and more shade provided than the, the city of Melbourne uh, trees. Uh, but when we break that down in terms of a cost-benefit ratio, we can look at the, the, the benefits provided. Uh, so dark is the city of Melbourne and light is the city of Hume. Um, and th this is just how the model works. It's not definitive and, and it needs to be tweaked for Australian conditions. But we can start to get an understanding of the cost-benefit ratio for street trees, actually putting some dollar value on these, on these things. Um, we're also directly quantifying the benefits of the urban street trees. And um, this is another project that Steve's running. Um, but basically, we've taken on what were old student dormitories from the Creswick campus of Melbourne Uni, which are these little sheds, um, known as Siberia to the students, um, which probably gives an indication of their insulation and energy efficiency. And we've, they've been decommissioned as unsafe and we've moved them to Burnley and we're doing experiments with them. This is a multi-faculty research project where we're trying to understand the benefits of street trees and other types of green infrastructure <coughs> for energy use and, and, um, and uh, benefits. And this is supported by the nursery and garden industry. So basically we've got uh, our little shed or model house uh, with an air conditioner on there. Uh, it's got a heat flux plates on all the walls, all the external surfaces to measure the heat going through the walls. Um, and then on two of the sheds we've got uh, trees on two sides. We've got deciduous trees and we've got native trees. And one of those trees is on a, a, a balance. So we're working out the energy saving benefit for the amount of 
water uh, there, so the, the cost benefit ratio there, so the water cost to energy saving. So trying to get a handle on those things that Greg was talking about in terms of actually quantifying things. Um, so uh, some data from, from these loggers, uh, basically the bottom one is heat flux through the building where it's green and when it's hotter, um, up here measured by the, uh, the temperature, the, the heat flux is energy being gained through the building, uh, through the walls. And so this is early data and we've, we've sort of been spent a bit of time tweaking the, the system but this is long term research infrastructure we can do lots of different things to over time. And, uh, and so yeah, we can take our actual data and see how it works to models, uh, work with the engineers, work with the architects to, to tweak uh, different types of green infrastructure and how they work around buildings. The last sort of uh, uh, application I'd like to talk about is, is something how we can try to change people's perceptions of, of water and, and relying on re or using research to, to change policy and, and, and behaviour. And uh, this is a smart gardening watering project which, which people like Jeff Cannell have been working on a lot uh, for a fair while and it builds on a lot of data that we've got at Burnley on the, the plants database, so the water use of different ornamental plants in the Melbourne context. And it allows people to design their gardens um, uh, according to water efficient uh, principles. It allows them to calculate how much water they'll use and then the size of the rainwater tank they may need to keep that garden uh, healthy. Um, also, the, the new version of it uh, shows participating gardens nearby so they can learn from each other what, have, what has one gardener done and, and how does that work, what plants are they using. Um, and, and also, uh, given the new information age, allows them to communicate via Facebook as well. So, um, about getting the community empowerment and behaviour change in the way people work, but it's based on science. There's data looking at the water use of those gardens. We've had people going out there. We've used data from the Burnley Plant Database in terms of how things will work. So in, uh, in future, I'd just like to highlight some future research detections. We need basic data. We need to overcome misconceptions. This is a quote from the uh, National Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility to a grant that Tim Fletcher, Andy and others and I put in, um, which basically highlights a lot of the decision makers still don't understand the value of urban water in terms of how we can use it for climate change adaptation. Um, we need best practice implementation guidelines so lots of local councils, private industry uh, can implement green infrastructure at low cost and we can share the experience. We're trying to do new things, we'll make mistakes, let learn from each other. And as Rod was pointing out, we need to evaluate the health benefits of green infrastructure, make an explicit link to public health outcomes and funding. In the UK, there's doctors who are able to prescribe a walk in the woods near people now as a legitimate health outcome. You know, can we do that? Can we tie it back to funding and then we'll, we'll um, make, make progress? And also integrating stormwater capture and reuse. How do we actually get that into our urban landscapes and with these green infrastructure outcomes a lot more? Um, thank you, and there's a whole lot of people, not just me, working on this, obviously.